to our last of the 2005-2006 uh, research seminar series for the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you our guest speaker, William Malik. Uh, Bill, as I call him normally, is a graduate student in computer science at the University of Waterloo. I've known Bill, I guess, for about two years now. And I've admired Bill with his enthusiasm uh, and his dedication to doing whatever <laughs> we've asked him to do in our uh, research group, uh, the computer systems group. Uh, he's uh, always been very dedicated to uh, getting things done, and, and it's been really a joy to work with Bill. On his own right, he's been working away at his uh, master's degree, and today he'll be talking about training nurses using physiological simulation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. I'm a graduate student here. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about a research project I'm involved in where we're exploring the effectiveness of training nurses using physiological simulation. To give you an outline, first I'm going to provide you with a bit of background on simulation itself. For some of you, this may be a review. Uh, it should be okay. I want to make sure everyone's on the same footing. I'm going to talk about what physiological simulation itself is. I'm going to take you on a tour of what I call the state of the art. I'm going to take you through a few examples that are really nice that show what physiological simulation is capable of and how it's used as a training tool. And then I'm going to talk about the systematic review that I'm currently involved in where we're trying to find out what the effectiveness really is of these tools. First of all, background. What is physiological simulation? I'm going to start out by what is simulation itself. It's the representation of the operation or features of one process or system through the use of another. We're really concerned with computer simulation, so that's the technique of representing the real world by a computer program. What, ideally, we want to in, uh, imitate the internal processes, not just the results of the thing that we're simulating. If, for instance, if we were simulating a bank, we don't want to know just simply to feed in how often people are going to arrive and come up with some bland number about what the waiting time was for that line. We'd rather be simulating each of the individuals involved, the tellers, the customers in those lines. We'd like to know, uh, we, ideally, we'd like to see them sitting in these lines. We'd like to know how long they had to wait themselves, what the queue was like, these sort of things in a simulation. So rather than just simply a black box with inputs and outputs, simulation should be more than this. Uh, what is simulation used for? Well, most uh, research involving simulation has been done in aviation, military, business. We talk about simulated workflows. This is one that I'm near and dear to my heart with uh, researching workflow. Uh, we're looking at things like uh, patient throughput in a hospital. We're looking at things like I talked about the banking example. Um, but today we're concerned with medicine. You, a concentration has been had on looking at using simulation to uh, train people in anesthesiologists and training nursing anesthesiologists. Uh, also, it's been used for things like developing drugs. We'll talk about and give you some examples of these. Uh, onto physiological simulation itself. My definition is that a physiological simulation involves the use of lifelike physical representations of humans, human organs, and other entities. For example, if we want to simulate a morphine injection, We'd like to be able to observe the physiological responses in, say, a well-equipped mannequin, where you could have pulse change, you could have uh, pupil dilation, you could have uh, respiratory heart and blood rate decreases. We'd like to be able to observe these in some type of physical representation, and that's what we're talking about here. Examples could be a full human simulation, what they call um, high-fidelity human patient computer simulators. Uh, you could be looking at human organs. You could be looking at the simulation of, say, a heart or kidney and watching as some type of intervention takes place to see just how that organ functions. Or you could be looking at simulating other entities, bacteria, enzymes, viruses, for example. Uh, advantages and disadvantages of simulation, uh, a particular physiological simulation, you really have a risk-free environment. If you're looking at simulation, you have what I'm calling a cheap experimentation environment. You can simulate a surgery, and if you make a mistake, you don't kill someone. You don't cause any adverse effect. You have this low to zero cost of life. You have an easily repeatable uh, environment in which to conduct these kind of training exercises. And you have a controlled setting where you can do things you wouldn't normally be able to do. If you're training someone to do surgery, you don't want to train them for the event that, say, the electrical power is lost. You can do that in this type of simulation without any worry or the risk involved. The main disadvantages are cost, both monetary and computationally. I'll give you an example of each in a moment. And really the question we come to is, are the benefits of using this simulation technology worth the cost? 
uh, for physio sorry, physiological simulation is used for developing drugs, experimentation, and what we're going to concentrate on later, which is training and education. Now, to take you through some of the more popular uses of simulation technology recently, first we're going to look at the simulation of a virus. What's so great about simulating viruses? Well, the simulation of enzymes are common, but when it comes to simulating a virus, it's much more complicated. Really, what you have to do, as we alluded to the ideal earlier, where you're simulating all the parts of something, we're going to be simulating all the parts of a virus. Um, to simulate the virus, they required reverse engineering the dynamics of all the atoms of the virus itself. Uh, that constituted approximately one million components, which had to be modeled. Uh, they were modeling a very simple virus, the satellite tobacco mosaic virus. This virus is very simple. It, it attacks on the back of another virus to be transported. It affects tomato plants and uh, tobacco. And it basically could, creates a discoloration on the plant itself. This is one of the more simple viruses, and still it had a million components. Um, they're touting it as the first atomic level simulation of a functioning organism, so the first full simulation of a living uh, being. It was performed at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign by Dr. Klaus Schulten and company. Uh, they required a supercomputer. It required over one year total work. So this was from planning to the final results. It was published in the March 2006 issue of journal, or sorry, of the journal Structure. This is a picture of what it looked like. Um, really, the question though becomes, why do you do something like this? Well, if you listen to one of the researchers, uh-oh, excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. Um, it allows us to see how the virus assembles and disassembles, says team member Peter Fridolino. Uh, because assembly and disassembly are two of the key steps in the viral life cycle, understanding these events could lead to developments of drugs designed to attack at these vulnerable points. This is what uh, one of the researchers says about it. The question becomes, what was the cost, though? Uh, it took a supercomputer, as we said. Uh, their simulation used only 256 processors at a time uh, and required only 128 gigabytes of total memory. Now, for anyone familiar with those numbers, that, that's quite a lot. It took 50 days to complete the entire simulation, and they were only able to simulate 50 nanoseconds. So this is quite an investment. And the question is, again, was it worth it? Was the, what that one researcher said true? Well, they actually had an outcome that was pretty surprising. Uh, they were able to observe that uh, the virus is not symmetrical. As it pulsates in and out, it does so asymmetrically. This, was, this verifies what they had already found in a wet lab. There's nothing special about this observation. But what they were able to do is speculate as to why. They found that uh, it had to do with the nucleic acid, RNA, and DNA within this virus. Um, you can see right here, this is a, a visualization of what they found. But they were able to take out this RNA and see that... Uh, they had an unstable structure. They were able to actually go in and do an experimentation on something which they had fully modeled and come up with a result which they weren't able to do in the wet lab. So the question of whether it was worth it is subjective, but they were able to come up with something they couldn't have otherwise. So this is sort of the, on one side of the spectrum of physiological simulation, this is sort of the highest tech, the most computationally advanced. This is sort of where the future lies. It was estimated that uh, although it took only 50 days to complete this uh, simulation using a supercomputer, using our current uh, technology, somewhere in the realm of 2040, they would have been finished doing the simulation of 50 nanoseconds. So this is where we're headed, but um, we're a long way from that. Coming closer to what we're used to seeing and what we'll be seeing in the, the types of studies I look at as far as training of nursing personnel, we look at the TCD simulator, simulating a part of the body and a diagnostic tool. Uh, the TCD simulator, uh, transcarneal Doppler ultrasonography. It's really an ultrasound which is done to check out the, um, as they say, a comprehensive virtual reality model of cerebral circulation. Um, a hemodynamic, hemodynamic meaning the movement of blood and forces uh, concerned therein, mainly uh, in the brain. Uh, this simulator includes all common forms of cere cerebrovascular disease, so you're able to load in different diseases which might occur in a patient and you have the diagnostic and therapeutic interventions at your disposal. So you can see what these different um, 
say, different diseases which a patient might have would look like on these different diagnostic tools, in particular this uh, transcranial Doppler. Now, I'm going to take a second to actually show you this, um, this device. Just a second. So what we have here is a representation of the, the body. It's, it's rather crude, but you can see the instrument here. You can see the results which we get off of the transcranial Doppler up in the top. If we move this device around, we can see the, the differences and changes. So there's sort of this one-to-one -one correspondence with where your virtual tool is and what your results are. Um, you can also, although I'm using currently the demo version, I didn't want to pay the money for this particular tool, it's about $250. Um, if you were to right click on one of the, oh sorry, they'll give you some uh, malpractice warnings, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, if you were to right click on any of the different areas, what you'll find is that you can change the different, um, the different uh, sorry, um, characteristics of that particular site on the body with just the click of a button. You're able to introduce things here, a 30% increase in stenosis. Um, again, it's not available, but on different sites of the body, you can do different things. Well, I'm not going to go into it too much right now, but uh, included with this tool as a training device, it, although it's rather crude, you see it over on the right we have a nice description of, say, for one thing, cerebral fluid circulation. There's a description on the right that you can read through, and what we find is that there's a tutorial set up. So I'm going to pull this other device over, which uh, as soon as you pop up this window, as soon as you start reading about this uh, cerebral spinal fluid circulation, you're given this device which would typically be used when you're working with this. So if you're actually monitoring, say, the fluid circulation levels, this is the diagnostic device you'd be looking at, the actual output you'd see inside some medical setting. Well, as you work through the, the tutorial here, you can see what injecting extra spinal fluid, or sorry, uh, cerebral spinal fluid will do. You can simply click on the button, and we see it increasing here. Uh, we can increase it to dangerous rates and watch just how this affects our patient. Pretty soon, well, I don't know if I've given enough, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see patient alarms. So we're starting to see just what we're doing is killing our patient or possibly killing them. So this is sort of a nice example of just what's available as far as uh, the sort of traditional technology we see on the computer. So without going to the realm of a physiological representation where we're holding it in our hands. This is the sort of thing you'll find on a simply a computer-based display. I'll now close this thing down. Back to our presentation. Now, uh, I've described as well, uh, on the slides you'll be able to find where you can download this particular device and more information on each of the demos I've talked about. Um, you saw the demonstration here. It seems somewhat crude. This this particular simulation was built in 2001. It's still being sold on the market for about $260 US. It seems like the sort of low end of the cost spectrum. And um, what I've seen so far, it seems like a, a decent training device itself, but we're not really focused on studying this particular one. Now to move on. This is sort of the, the high end as far as what we consider a training device to be. Simulation of an entire body. Uh, HHPCS, as I mentioned earlier, a high fidelity human patient computer simulator. What we're talking about are realistic full body patient simulators. So a mannequin with um, different physiological responses which um, are quite uh, realistic in their portrayal. Uh, the purpose really was to study human performance and improve education. So that was the entire reason for the introduction of these particular simulators. Uh, what do they do? Well, they provide a realistic functioning cardiovascular system. Everything from pulses and measurable blood pressure um, to the hemodynamic monitoring capabilities, which we just saw on a, a simple program. Well, this is, this is something that comes out into real, the real world, where you have the actual monitoring devices in the room with the mannequin, where you can observe these different interventions. 
uh, you have an airway and functioning respiratory system, which has uh, the self-regulated spontaneous ventilation, everything down to measurable exhaled gases. So if you were to breathe in oxygen, it will register how much you've done and it will give out the appropriate level of carbon dioxide. Um, it has reactive pupils, um, output drainage, a pharma pharmacological system. So the pharmacological system, again, the original intent of these systems was to be used in anesthesiology. So, of course, this is one of the bigger features that you can inject drugs into it and see what the results are. Now, uh, what does it provide? Again, the controlled risk-free environment is the real big payoff. You have this real-time feedback for learners. So this is why it's a good training tool. Uh, it's based on both their skills and decision-making. They can see the exact effects of their interventions, and not only are they are you deciding what their decision-making capability is. In the case of what we just saw in that simulation, it was how much uh, cerebral uh, fluid you're injecting. It's not just the decision in this case, but it's also the physical skills of the uh, particular either anesthesiologist or nurse who's performing them that can be evaluated. And the learning occurs in the situation with real physical, or sorry, physiological feedback. Uh, what does one look like? Well, here's a picture of one of these um, high fidelity simulations. I'll actually show you um, another one here. We've got Gus. So this is, we can look around Gus's room. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Gus in just a moment. But we can actually take a look around his, this environment here. Um, I'll zoom out so we can, uh, this is zoomed out as we get. We can zoom right in on Gus if we want. You can see that you know, he's, he's pretty ugly looking, but um, I like to think that uh, he's still quite realistic, even right down to the gown. If you look around the room, though, what you're seeing is the, the sort of the situation, if you had a bunch of nurses and doctors around this, that really resembles what you'll find in practice. Um, you'll find uh, different diagnostic equipment. We can zoom in if we want. Um, you can see they have all the displays around the room. Um, as we come to the, let's see right here, we have the control room back here. So um, this is where you would set things like a, this particular scenario, which is going to be occurring. I'll talk about that in a moment when I talk about Gus. Uh, but this is sort of a, a nice portrayal of what you find in this environment. Now moving on, this is the example. We're going to talk about Gus now. Uh, the Georgetown University Simulator, a life-size mannequin with computer-integrated physiological features, a good example. Um, the different characteristics I talked about a moment ago are not necessarily found in all. The, they're sort of the representative. In, in Gus, this particular model, it has a chest which rises when it breathes, realistic heart and lung sounds, um, measures intake of oxygen and uh, expiring carbon dioxide, as I mentioned. You can intubate this thing. You can uh, give it a tracheotomy. You can administer drugs, and you get realistic reactions to all of those. Uh, what do you, as a learning tool itself, uh, Gus can load different scenarios. You can, using that computer in the back, you can load up that right now Gus is going to be a 42-year-old man with coronary artery disease. Or you can load up that he'll be a 90-year-old woman with heart failure and arterial fibrillation. Uh, the question really becomes, uh, what does this do? Well, the different reactions, which are based on your interventions, uh, you will get different reactions based on the characteristics of your patient. So although you can't physically change the size of Gus, at least not at this moment, uh, you can change the characteristics which you go into them, and they'll be affected realistically. Um, again, as I say, you can also load different events. This is going back to the earlier example of the lights go out, so the total electrical failure, what do you do? We're able to simulate that in this environment. Uh, you can actually pause the simulation to review. So if your patient goes into cardiac arrest because you've done something wrong, your uh, instructor can pause the actual simulation, step in, take a look at all the diagnostic tools, even re rewind the simulation to take a look and see where it is that you made a mistake. Um, Gus is used to teach and evaluate. Uh, you can assess skills. You can use them for teaching of different concepts, uh, including uh, advanced cardiac life support techniques. Uh, the cost of Gus, this is the big question. We talked about before, a $260 simulation on your screen or a $200,000 simulation laying on your table. Uh, this was a, a few years ago. Uh, we'll get to more recent numbers soon, but they're still in the same neighborhood of needing about $200,000 to provide one of these. That's uh, simply the cost of the device itself in the room. Uh, you're talking about a lot more money when you consider the training of the personnel who need to use this, which is something that's often overlooked. Now, uh, what are we doing at home? Um, Actually, I'm going to stop before I get to this point. I'm going to show you guys a video of Gus in action. Actually, Gus's cousin, Sam. Um, let's see here. Okay, hopefully you'll all be able to hear the sound here. 
This is um, a little promotional video I got from one of the companies who are trying hard to push these uh, realistic mannequin simulations. Other components of the simulator are a full body computer controlled mannequin known as SAM or simulated anesthesiology mannequin, a state of the art real time computer system, an easy to use operator's console, a compact rugged interface card, and software incorporating high fidelity physiology and drug models. The simulator patient, Sam, is no ordinary dummy. Sam provides key feedback to the anesthetist during the training scenario. The functional mouth and airway permits masking and intubation, including esophageal intubation and tongue swelling for difficult intubation. The working lungs provide spontaneous breathing and can be mechanically or manually ventilated. Lung compliance and resistance can be dynamically modified to represent various physiological conditions, such as pneumothorax. Carotid and radial pulses may be felt. Heart and breath sounds can be detected with a stethoscope. Intravenous lines may be inserted and drugs administered. Monitoring equipment includes invasive lines and non-invasive blood pressure cuff, pulse oximeter, cap and graph, temperatures, <coughs> cardiac output, and ECG reads. Sam's thumb will even twitch in response to stimulus. I think that last part's a little creepy. But, um, so there, that's a little introduction to Sam and sort of one of the promotional videos you'll find. Um, I would think they'd be higher quality since you pay a lot more for the device you get. But um, in any case, that's a sort of a little bit of a, a walk through what's going on in uh, these realistic mannequin simulations. Now I'm just going to talk about how they're being used a little bit in Canada. I'm going to do a couple of examples of Canadian universities who use this. Uh, one it, that's been in existence since 1999 is the University of Ottawa. They have a patient care simulation center. You can find out a lot about it. I'll give you the link in a minute. But basically, they use what they call high realism simulation. It's the same thing as what we've seen here. Um, their typical applications, they wheel these things right into lectures. And when they're giving a talk about, say, uh, physiology or clinical medicine and how your interventions uh, react, they will wheel them right into the room and use them as a teaching aid. So it's directly to the, the idea of education, although it's not the type of throw somebody in the ICU that we'd expect with one of these dummies. Um, in, the, in the second stance, they, for acute care, they actually do that, though. They simulate the ICU itself. So they'll put the, the different um, surgeons or, or, say, nurses in training right into the situation. They can use it for airway management. Um, they get to a couple of clinical anesthesia skills. This is one of the common ones. That you heard uh, Sam was the a simulated anesthesiology uh, mannequin. This is one of the places they've used it uh, classically. So, um, Team skills is one of the things they really push, though. They say that uh, in this sort of situation, you can have your group and you can practice what they call crisis resource management. So they have entire classes built up around this where you're around the simulator, something goes terribly wrong, some type of crisis, and the whole uh, event is to see what your decision making is going to be under pressure and to, to really train those type of skills that they couldn't in a regular residency. Uh, and then service to the industry is one that I found uh, rather uh, kind of peculiar, but once I started thinking about it, it was kind of interesting. They had this idea that people from industry were building, say, um, a better stethoscope, I'm going to say, but uh, much more complicated systems than that, can go in and study how the surgeons or nurses are interacting with the patient in this sort of setting. and They can get a controlled feel for it. So they can produce a better product. This is one of the, their aims anyways. You can learn more uh, at the website listed here. And closer to home, we have the uh, University of Toronto. They've just put in something they're calling the Sims Lab, a clinical simulation learning center. Uh, this is brand new, state of the art. They have 18 of these uh, simulation mannequins, which range right from adult to um, infants. So they have quite a range. Um, they also have an isolation room for infectious disease training. So you'll be in an isolated area, say, in the event of SARS. They can train for those sort of emergencies or contingencies. So this is uh, the sort of things which are allowed at their uh, facility. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our systematic review. Now that we have an idea of what's going on sort of in simulation uh, and what simulation itself is, I'll talk about what we're going to be doing. We had a goal, and that's to enable healthcare educators to increase the effectiveness of the use of simulation to educate nurses. Specifically, we'd like to identify what simulation tools have the potential for the greatest impact. 
Um, intuitively, you would say it's these uh, high fidelity simulations, but we need to get at some proof and we need to see uh, really what we can come to as far as um, a consensus. So um, our research question was, what common themes exist in the literature regarding the effectiveness of physiological simulation tools in the nursing environment? Now, why did we choose these physiological simulations? Because of many of the uh, reasons I've mentioned so far, uh, high quality, realistic environment, we feel they're the future. Uh, why nursing them? This is the, the real question. Um, there's shortages in healthcare providers that's on the horizon. Uh, this means that the nurses' responsibilities are changing. We have a, an increase in uh, what we call advanced practice nurses, uh, nurse practitioners for one, nurses who are taking on the many of the classical duties of a, a doc, sorry, a clinician themselves. Um, we, but even your standard nurse, their roles are really increasing. They they need to go back and get more education, and this could be really one of the places, the ways in which they get this education in a high quality manner. Uh, there's a gap in studies also for nursing education. There are many studies, um, uh, an amazing amount, on the effectiveness of these kind of tools for teaching anesthesiologists. We're looking at now uh, trying to come together with a systematic review of everything that's out there as far as nursing education using these tools. So that's where we're coming from. And we have a dual focus. We're going to look at really what the critical and learning outcomes have been of these studies. So for us, it's really important that we have some kind of a a feedback that they've measured the learning which has taken place. We're going to be using uh, Bloom's taxonomy of uh, educational objectives for cognitive domain. Um, I might ask Jen to speak on this just a little bit at the end because she's going to be doing this particular part. We're going to really be looking at was there effective learning done in the, in the studies we looked at. And I'm going to be looking at the technical aspects. Uh, if we look at Meller, he did a, a survey of what simulation tools were used for in medicine in general. And he was looking at uh, Categorizing the elements of the clinical experience, whether it be the actual patient sitting on the table, whether it's another doctor you're working in that might be simulated, or sorry, working with that might be simulated, or the diagnostic tests and equipment that, you're, that are being used. So you identify those pieces and see how the interactions occur. And uh, eventually I'll be looking at the underlying models if, if we get to that point. Um, the real thing we're trying to do is make some kind of correlation between the characteristics of the simulations involved in the learning which came out of them. Our systematic review. Uh, we looked at the uh, ARCHI, the, the Alberta Research Center for Child Health Education based uh, framework for doing systematic reviews. They basically have something that goes, it's a systematic approach which you formulate your question, develop protocol, right down to the point of where you interpret the results. Um, you can find more uh, information on here, but this is the protocol we followed. I'll highlight a couple of the points. Um, our inclusion criteria is that we're looking at any physiological simulation for nursing education which has sufficient technical detail in order to do the sort of correlation we'd like. Um, the types of studies we're looking at are studies which involve either practicing nurses coming back for continued education or nurses who are uh, nursing students, and outcome measures have to be included. We need to be able to somehow measure that critical thinking or some type of learning took place. It's not enough for us to have just a simple uh, editorial. Um, and our search strategy is just to look in some of the more uh, obscure journals as well as Medline and Ovid. Um, initial results of our systematic review, uh, we've gotten through two, uh, well, we're in the process of going through our second set of journals. When we looked at Ovid, uh, we searched for simulation and nursing to begin with. Uh, we came up with 300 initial results, which were trimmed to 60 after reviews of titles and abstracts. And finally, we found 22 uh, reviews, which will be included. Um, then we've looked at PubMed, where we found um, an overwhelming 616 initial results which were trimmed to 121, which we're now working through to find out which ones can be included. We have approximately 30 at the moment, so uh, about 50 uh, results from the two sources so far. So what have we uncovered, though? Well, I have some highlights. They're, they're just simply um, from a couple of studies that seemed uh, more profound, the nice quotes, basically. Uh, that the use of anesthesiology patient simulators was shown to significantly improve the overall response times and performances of anesthesiologists. Um, and when they measured uh, responses to using this, when they looked at what students responded, they all found that uh, they gave the highest possible rating to the experience of going through the simulation. Some numbers that came out, um, as of 2001, approximately 150 patient simulator facilities were in operation worldwide. And uh, the prices ranged from uh, 30,000 US for the uh, ACLS models. It's just the advanced cardiac life support. So just looking at things along that lines. Uh, up to the 180,000 uh, for the state-of-the-art anesthesiology patients, which we saw, or sorry, patient models, which we saw earlier. Um, let's see. And one really nice quote that came out of another survey was that um, the simulation allowed these nurses to think on their feet, not in their seat. 
This is sort of the, the one thing that sticks with me. Now, a summary of the, the common themes we've seen so far. We haven't uh, gotten to the point of doing, the, I'm going to say, a formal result. But what we've seen so far, the, the, um, the commonalities are that uh, simulation really seems to be an effective tool for nursing. That uh, it provides the participative and interactive learning environment. And along those lines, the stronger the immersion, so the more realistic the environment, the better the reinforced, or sorry, reinforced the critical learning is. Uh, there really seems to be no common problems found, at least we haven't found any yet, as far as the learning which occurs. They're mainly due to uh, some of the problems I'll cite in a minute. But we've also found the emergence of a couple of other things that were interesting. Uh, emergence of this idea of a standardized patient for assessment, that you can use these high fidelity simulations. You can load up the same patient for each one of your doctors who's going to be going through the process, or in our case, nurses, and assess them all on an equal playing field. And uh, there are many articles which cite that patient safety is promoted by using this kind of training. As far as problems, uh, we've seen the cost of simulations as being very high, uh, both uh, computationally and, uh, I'm going to say, monetarily. Uh, the other things they say are reliability and maintenance, what happens when these things go down, who fixes them. And, of course, uh, technical support and training are something that's not figured into the costs here. It can be ongoing. It can be co quite costly to train one of your staff who might not previously have uh, used this sort of simulation to run the equipment. Uh, as I say, these are initial results. Uh, it's too early to say uh, uh, what the results of our systematic review are, but uh, as far as what we've seen so far, we're pretty optimistic. Uh, and our goal really is that um, we're going to say to enable healthcare educators to increase the effectiveness of uh, the use of simulation to educate nurses, as I said before. Really what we're looking at is that self-directed li lifelong learning is a fact of life for any care provider, and we believe simulation can help with this. Now, just to give you a bit of an idea, our next steps, well, we're going to complete our literature searches and our analysis. And really, our target completion date is October 2006 to have all of these different reviews done and to try to publish. Uh, we've already submitted our abstract to the Information Technology and Communications and Health, the ITCH conference. Uh, we're hoping that it will be included for the next uh, occurrence. And just to give a little wrap up the acknowledgments of what we've done, uh, this is a ChIPSTEP project. ChIPSTEP is the uh, CIHR Health Informatics PhD postdoc strategic training program. It's a cross-Canada program which is supposed to promote and train different uh, PhDs and postdocs in health informatics to give them an exposure they might not previously have had. Uh, we'd like to thank them for f their funding and support without which this research is not possible. Uh, ChIPSTIP works with mini cohorts, so these small groups which uh, get together to do these projects. Well, our mini cohort involves myself. Uh, Jennifer Jewer, who might say a few words in a minute, who's a graduate student here in the Department of Management Sciences. And finally, Dominic, um, Dominic Covey, who is a professor here and also the mentor for us on this project. And uh, thank you. Well, I just wanted to thank Bill for uh, putting all this together in a couple of weeks and uh, giving everybody a good uh, overview of what simulation is. Um, as he said, uh, my role in this has been uh, participating in the systematic review. And um, we, I think uh, maybe if I just talked about why we decided to do that uh, a little bit more. Um, we, as, as Bill mentioned, we're in the uh, CHIPSIT program. and. I think it's a good place for us to do this kind of review uh, because they they are training um, involving medical students, uh, actual practicing doctors, PhD students, uh, any grad students as well, in in performing systematic reviews. A lot of them have performed systematic reviews in the past, so we have a good base of knowledge on how to actually perform a systematic review from them. And um, they also, because there are, a lot of them are practicing in the medical uh, profession, we have that source of knowledge as well. So, um, and I... I think that's about it, really. I mean, we've uh, we've we've started our searches. Um, we originally started because of the fact that uh, there's been a lot of talk about the benefits of simulation, but we haven't seen a lot of studies um, that are actually evidence-based research. You know, actually showing. Um, uh, quantitative results on on the benefits. So. Um, 
in our initial searches, uh, I did the uh, Ovid search, and um, even from those 22 studies which I found, I think actually a lot of them will be eliminated because they don't provide enough information uh, in order to actually accurately uh, evaluate the results. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to find more studies, uh, even if we don't, I think it's a, it's a finding that perhaps more research in this area is actually uh, needed. So. Uh, Jennifer, you, your part of it, as I understand, is the evaluation of the uh, effectiveness, if you want, of these systems. And one of the issues is w whether or not people, in fact, learn better uh, with these systems, perhaps compared to other methods. Can you talk at all about the framework, or at least you're thinking about it so far, that you will use uh, as to the measurement of effectiveness? Uh, well, as Bill showed on uh, one of the slides, we're looking at the uh, critical thinking abilities and um, Bloom's taxonomy uh, for the learning outcomes. Um, critical thinking is an important, uh, has, has been shown in, in a lot of studies to be an important aspect for nurses, uh, for nurses really. So I think that's an important aspect of, of looking at, and hopefully we'll be able to find it in the studies uh, that they've actually looked at, at these uh, criteria. Um, critical thinking uh, is important for independent and interdependent decision making, which is very important for nurses. And, and there's also a learning outcome uh, taxonomy, which is really well known. And so I'm going to be applying the different, uh, trying to see, I guess, uh, the ways in which the different studies actually applied or evaluated their learning outcomes based upon these taxonomies. So they mightn't have actually used this taxonomy, but if I can, you know, just apply sort of what they said into the taxonomy, hopefully. Questions or comments from anyone? I'll get you the microphone for your question. First, congratulations on a nice presentation. Um, my question is about when you, in this related to your question about learning outcomes, have you thought of looking at modal learning at all separately? I mean, a large part of clinical practice is, is the performance of technical skills via the a, a intubation or giving a needle or performing a surgical procedure. Um, is your review addressing that issue at all? Well, I think uh, what we, we are trying to be, um, try to apply it as a, at a high level because of the lack of studies really that are in this area. So by looking at these general learning um, outcomes or critical thinking, um, hopefully we'll be able to take that into consideration, but there really are a lack of studies. So just trying to look at that aspect might be, uh, might be difficult, but uh, perhaps we could add it to our, uh, to our, to our search. Bill, when you listed the uh, uh, potential costs of doing simulations, I think you skipped one, which may not apply here, but, uh, but on the surface it does, and that is uh, the possibility of approximation error. Because, of, because it's a simulation, there is some approximation going on, um, depending on, uh, depending on the, the, the nature of the simulation, that approximation error could be large or could be small. Um, but uh, that is then a, um, a negative part of doing a simulation. Yeah, there, there's one uh, example. When I talked earlier about, um, I wonder if I can show you the picture here again. Um, when we were here and we, we were talking about um, really what's going on, that they've somehow done something amazing here, uh, the question really, let me see if I can go back here. Um, I'm saying at the bottom, but they were able to speculate as to why. And you read the actual articles, they're trying to say that they've, gone past what you find in science where you, you observe something and you make a hypothesis. They're trying to say that they've shown that this is the reason, uh, which I've not gone to that extreme repeating here. Um, that may not even be exactly what they've said either from what I've taken, um, you know, whether or not you know, that's the proof. But really that, that's what we're coming down to. They can speculate as to why. So you're right. Uh, we can't get, let's say, the precision we might expect out of this. I think that's why we're, we're trying to look at the patient health simulators rather than concentrating on these type of uh, simulating a virus. I'm sure it's helpful, but you're right. I'm sure that the cost of uh, error is great. I, th I think just following up on what Frank has said, the, uh, if, you, if you look at your viral uh, simulation there with the number of objects, I mean, what you're doing there in order to do that is not only represent the objects, but represent their physics 
presumably their forces, so that how that thing folds inside is, a, is an example of, of physics, and how the capsid is, distributes its, its pieces is also affected by physics. And you wonder to what degree that's simulated. And given the size and complexity of this, uh, this is a lot simpler problem than the folding of, of very simple proteins. So you wonder to what degree they actually did fi simulate the physics, because that's a, that is an incredibly complex system. Even 50 days sounds like, uh, and maybe not only uh, is it a complex system, but they probably used approximations or pieces of simulation rather than total brute force. So one, I mean, when they see something, they cannot be sure that it's real or not. So I think the words. Uh, speculation is a good word. You can bring up questions, but you're not sure you're seeing reality. Do you agree with that? I mean, have you looked at uh, into the... Yeah, and, that's... and I think like a lot of the studies actually do not really propose that simulation should replace any other forms of training. You know, it's, it's one aspect of a whole training environment, I guess. So, and that was that, and that uh, the realism was a... Um, disadvantage that was noted in past studies as well, because that is not a realistic environment. So that's where these new uh, human uh, simulators are hoping to improve on that, basically. You can only simulate what you've taken into account. Uh, so we have, pa we have plane simulators that have been for decades simulating the forces on wings, lift and drag and so on, uh, but they didn't predict super stall in aircraft where the wings ended up creating a uh, turbulence that the tail got stuck in, in high tail planes. So again, here you always wonder what's accounted for. Have they accounted, for example, for the ionic environment of the virus? I mean, that's kind of some of the interesting questions. This would change if you had it in water versus a, a dilute acid, for example. So uh, it's, it's an interesting problem. The Probably the most interesting simulation I've seen recently is the simulation of an E. coli bacterium right down to the fundamental chemistry. That's work underway. But it's looked towards as a, a future answer where then you don't have to experiment uh, on uh, animals or in, on microorganisms. You can use this as a way of predicting how a, an agent will be metabolized or affect the cell. So that, that's another one to look at is the E. coli simulation work that's going. It's a vast project. And, uh, I guess the only other question that uh, I wanted to ask about your Gus is, to what degree, and are you looking into this, is to what degree are they simulating? Is it like flight simulator, which is basically a whole bunch of tables that for a given attitude change in the plane, it looks up what the uh, likely um, uh, altitude or increase will be, lift increase altitude. So it's not really simulating the processes. It's got a table that looks things up and, and determines the activity, shows the thing, but you don't know if the table is correct. How far are they going in, Gus? Is it down to simulating, for example, the elasticity of blood vessels, or is it table lookup for if you have this change in blood pressure, you'll have that change in urine output? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking into that as well. That's one of actually the research questions. Um, we've come to the conclusion that there's a lot more than just Gus and Sam, and that there's a quite a large family of these simulators out there. Um, when we talked about Gus, that was the only one available at the time. This was 2001. Now there are, I'm going to say, dozens of them. And what I want to look at is really at the end, I'm, I'm speculating that we're going to come to the conclusion that this is the, the way to go, this is the most effective type, and then looking at which one works best, we'll then deal, dig deeper into seeing which ones are representing things and which ones are really simulating them. And uh, so far I, I've noticed that at least in Gus and a little bit of the propaganda that surrounded it, and Sam as well, that they talk about you're able to feed in different simulation models for the different pieces, so I'm wondering if it's a case of you purchase the simulator itself, um, the, the mannequin, the piece that is there, and you purchase this, um, well, you obviously have the computer interface, but you also are purchasing separate computer hardware and sort of the model is a separate piece. So you simulate down to whatever is most appropriate for you in things like this anesthesiology um, and when, when they're looking at things like, say, a respiratory, um, there, is it appropriate for them to be going down to the point of uh, analyzing the structure of, say, the oxygen coming in to determine what the car uh, carbon dioxide coming out is, is it worth it for them to go to the point of simulating, or is the lookup table good enough? I think it, it's based on the situation where they are. It seems to be an interchangeable component of these devices. So uh, eventually that will be one of the things we want to answer from this research. Any chance to see any of these things, like at UFG? Or oh, I haven't gone out yet. Um, Might be fun. Well, uh, I'm hoping to anyways. It seems, uh, especially U of T being so accessible. Uh.
No further questions? If not, Bill, thank you. Jennifer, thank you.